Nita, so Nita Pisks. Nilta Liwis, Wanahawa Gossett, Najio Banawapskek, Nalita Haziu Andayan. My name is Sherry Mitchell. I'm from the Penobscot Nation, and I'm honored to be here with you tonight. One of the things I want to start out talking about is this um, comment about this uprising, uprising of indigenous people being a new thing. Um, that's mythology. It's an illusion. It's what happens when we have an awakening and suddenly we see things that we hadn't seen before. In 1934, Felix Cohen, who was the architect of federal Indian uh, law as it stands today, he was the writer of the Cohen Handbook on Federal Indian, Indian Law, which is still um, the most used and relied upon document uh, in the field of Federal Indian Law, said that the Indian is the miner's canary, that what happens to the Indian uh, will eventually happen to us all, and that the treatment of Indians is the signal from, poisonous uh, from fresh air to poisonous gas within our political system. The type of ecological genocide that is now being experienced all over the world began on the edges and in the midst of indigenous communities. And we have been facing this struggle for hundreds of years in some form or another, and certainly for the last 50 years here um, in a real accelerated way. And the reason that indigenous people are now starting to get the attention around these issues that they had never before received uh, is that these impacts are leaking out into the commons and that other people are starting to be impacted by those things. And right now, uh, the momentum is building because we have a nexus between indigenous rights, environmental justice, and human survival. And so that's what's bringing us all together. All of our prophecies talk about a time when the planet was going to be in severe distress and at that time, people would rise up from all races, from all corners of the world, and then they would unite to make the planet green again. And so that's what we're doing. We're uniting, we're rising up from all corners of the world, we're beginning to see each other for the first time in our history. And I believe that we're all in this process of mass awakening, and for the first time in history, we're in the process of an evolutionary leap, and it's conscious which means that we have the ability to direct the movement. We have the ability to determine the direction of that leap. And I think that that's really exciting. Um, it's certainly a challenge, but I think it's an incredible opportunity for us to really bring forth our highest form of creative intelligence and um, be able to solve these problems together in a unified way. So, even with all of the disturbing elements that this challenge poses, to me, uh, it's a hopeful experience that even if we do not solve these problems and we exit the planet, as spiritual beings, we're gonna exit the planet united. And to me, that's a beautiful thing. So, uh, talking a little bit about what happened in Paris from the perspective of an indigenous person who does this work on a really broad scale, um, I think that one of the things that was telling at the outset was the removal of indigenous rights from the document. One of the things that we've been seeing um, in recent years is that there is a systematic attack on indigenous rights all over the planet. The most powerful attack that we've seen in over 100 years on indigenous rights. There's true termination uh, policies that have been enacted and um, that are being played out all over the globe. And this is all connected to um, industry's desire to move unchecked across the planet. And indigenous people have a set of unique rights that protects them, which makes indigenous people natural allies for all those that are impacted by these things. Um, because we actually have lands that are untouched. We have protections that are unique. Uh, and the importance of people standing with indigenous people during these times is really critical to the survival of this planet. Because if we allow those lands to be taken, the last untouched, the last pristine places on the planet, because we're turning a blind eye to the plight of indigenous people, then we actually sign our own death warrant. And that at this point in time, 
it's crucial to recognize the correlation between that and what happened in Paris. It's critical to recognize the attack on the Penobscot River that's going on right now and its connection to industry. It's critical to recognize that the taking of Oak Flat, the Apache sacred lands, and the giving of those lands to a uh, French mining company is connected to the path that we're on. All of these things are connected to the path that we're on. Um, the attack on indigenous rights has really amped up um, since the discussions around the TPP have amped up. If you have um, corporations that can sue states and nations uh, for their denial of profitability under environmental regulation or a number of other laws, um, do you think that all of the laws that protect indigenous people are going to be a hindrance to their profitability? So it's in the interest of those nations and states that are um, hoping to get passage of the TPP to start deteriorating those rights right now. So again, the indigenous people are the canary in the coal mine. And what's going on with these issues across the world um, is indicative of where humanity is going and it's really imperative for people to pay attention to that. So it's heartening to me to see that these issues are actually coming into the forefront, that people are starting to recognize what's happening. And hopefully there's still time for us to be able to resolve these problems together. The carbon credit market is, um, as Megan said, a um, false solution. It is um, a smoke and mirrors trick. It's a shell game. And the introduction of this proposed solution um, in the Paris talks, to me, demonstrated what an absolute sham the whole process was. Because this wasn't about finding climate solutions. This was about creating a market for our air. This was about the commodification of one of the last sources of our survival. They have commodified the soil, they have commodified the water, and now they're commodifying the air. And this is a fast track to the total destruction of our planet. And not only is it a sham uh, because it's creating a market, but it also increases pollution. It increases pollution under the guise of it being displaced by someone else maintaining a piece of pristine land. Because what's happening is that it's resulting in huge land grabs all over the planet. The native crops um, in that area are being raised and genetically modified crops are being planted. They've been included in this carbon market. Um, we all know what big monoculture agribusiness does to the soil, it destroys the soil. So you have these natural habitats, these balanced ecosystems that are being destroyed under the guise of the carbon credit program. And in their place, they're putting things that are actually going to destroy our arable soil. So it's more destructive than it at first appears. It's also leading to the displacement and the removal of indigenous people all over in South, Central and South America and Africa. Um, and now they're pushing for a big carbon program here. And I'm very proud to say that my tribe unanimously voted against accepting carbon credits. So I think that one of the things that we need to recognize is that, as Megan alluded to, this is not just a climate crisis. This is a spiritual and mental crisis. This is a crisis of the heart. And unless we're willing to look at it as a spiritual and mental illness, unless we're willing to look at it as a crisis of the heart, we're not going to have any ability to be able to resolve these issues. All of the issues that are connected to this that, you know, me, Megan, Iris have talked about are all related to this crisis of the heart. And that as we try to address this challenge that we're facing, we have to be willing to face that challenge in a heart-based way. 
we have to bring the heart that's missing from this process into the work that we're doing, which means that we have to really look at the way that we do activism, and we have to look at the history of conquest that our ideologies have been built upon, and we have to start looking at the way that those ideologies are embedded into the way that we think about activism because we have to be doing love-based activism and we need to stop doing conquest-based activism. This isn't about conquering the man. This isn't about tearing down and destroying so that we can just supplant one other system on top of another. This isn't about I'm the good guy and you're the bad guy. And if we continue to couch it in those terms, then all we're going to do is continue the cycles of conquest that we've been living under for hundreds of years. And that conversation has got to change. So what we need to do in regard to that is we need to recognize that we are all part of one unified system. And we need to change the way that we define citizenry. We need to change the way that we look at the world in regard to uh, these humanistic values. We've been very human oriented in everything that we've been doing. We have to expand our ideas of citizenry to all living things. Um, we have one of our creation stories says that we were born when Gluskop, who is the man from nothing, shot an arrow into the ash tree and we all emerged from that space. What that reminds us is that that ash tree is our kin that we were born of the same foundational elements that make up that ash tree. It's the same with every living and non-living thing on this planet. We're all stardust and water. We're all related, we're all interconnected, what we call uh, in Dilnabamuk. We're all kin. My, you know, in Dilnabamuk means all of my relations. It includes the entire creation. So we need to start thinking about that as we're addressing these issues and not look at the other as our enemy, but as somebody who's suffering from a spiritual and mental illness. And how would we treat somebody that was suffering from a spiritual and mental illness and bring our heart into this process? One of the things that I think is um, really important as we move forward and we're trying to resolve these issues is to think about the fact that um, we've been operating under a truly imbalanced system. There are two energies that are in play in all systems of creation. We have a masculine energy and a feminine energy, and that's not gender specific. There is, uh, the masculine energy is uh, activity oriented, it's out there, it's external. Um, the feminine energy is internal. And so we have stories that um, our clan system is structured upon these stories that we um, are told from birth on up about how um, the woman is brought, and this is purely for the sense of the story. As I said, these energies are not gender specific. The feminine is brought under the skin of the masculine. And what the role of the feminine is, is to connect that masculine energy to the wisdom and intuition of the heart and to the divine because a woman's body is a gateway into this world. It provides a means for spirit to enter into this universe. And so um, what happens then is that all of the activity, all of the energy, all of the um, external movement of that masculine energy on the outside is guided by that heart-based, nurturing, life-sustaining, life-supporting, life-protective energy of the divine feminine that is inside. We have completely eliminated um, the role of the divine feminine and that energy, that heart-based, life-nurturing, life-supporting, life-sustaining energy from our decision-making for hundreds of years. And it's time for that to come back into play and so as we start thinking about how do we address these issues, that has to be a part of the discussion. How do we reincorporate that so that we move away from a purely destructive movement to one that is actually based in creation? And so as we're moving forward, we have this word in our language called smogness. 
And what Samognus is, is, it is a term, one of our terms for a warrior. And it describes a process of holding back the flow of harm that is coming toward you to the degree that you prevent the harm, but you do not harm the other. You prevent the harm, but you do not harm the other. And I think that's a key part of the equation. We have to stem the flow of harm that's coming our way. But on the back side of that is this energy of creation, where we're creating the type of world that we want to inhabit. We cannot make a demand for any type of right without creating a world where that demand can be met. And so we as the citizens, we the people, have to take responsibility for creating energy sovereignty. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. We have to take responsibility for creating food sovereignty. We have to take responsibility for educational sovereignty because it's going to take critical, creative thinking to be able to solve these problems. We do not create critical, creative thinkers under the current educational systems. So if we want to be able to move forward, we have to be thinking about these types of things and incorporating that knowledge base to form the, st the framework that we're operating under. And I think that we um, have grossly underestimated the power that we have when we're together. There's one more thing I'm going to tell you, and hopefully it'll take 90 seconds and then I'll be done. Um, there's a, the story, the a Guyana Shagoa that comes out of um, Haudenosaunee. It's the great law of peace. And one of the aspects of that story is that um, Hiawatha, who is one of the heroes of the story, along with Daganawida, who is the peacemaker, uh, holds up his hand and says, something as simple as a human hand can topple this 150 foot um, pine tree. So there's, in the story, there's a pine tree. The tree is uprooted. All the weapons are placed into it. And on top of that, a tree of peace is formed. And so he said, something as simple as a human hand, when it's working in unison, when it's all working together, all five fingers working together, can actually topple this great tree. And that great tree represents the lie of warfare that we have been fed. This lie that we've all embedded into our psyche that drives the way that we work, even our nonviolence is violent, um, in that it's aimed at destroying a system that we no longer feel is worthy. So when we think about that aspect, that something as simple as a human hand can solve these problems, when it's together, when all five fingers are working together, that's representative of what we can do when we're all working together um, so that we can actually uproot this tree that's dying and taking us all with it and plant a new tree of life. And I think that the way that we do that is to focus on creation rather than destruction, to focus on what we have in common instead of what we um, disagree on because whatever we feed grows and we know that whatever we feed grows. And so if we want to actually grow the type of world um, that supports and sustains the dreams and the visions that we all have, then we have to really be focused on how we do that, how we invest our energy. So I'm going to stop there. But thank you so much for your time.